two interrelated forces. Uh, one, our desperation. We're waking up to the fact that uh, we're destroying the, pl the ecology and the planet itself so that we can't continue to uh, destroy the planet and still have s survive. So we're desperate about that. And there's a growing body of people that are getting connected who have a different vision. And uh, they're starting to grow. Uh, some research shows that people with this vision about 20 years ago, there might have been 5%. Now this is rapidly growing. And I'm fortunate enough as I travel around the world, I'm meeting these people in every country who have a different vision of what the good life is all about than uh, the people who are contributing to the violence on the planet. Well, I think that um, in the last couple of hundred years, uh, we've again uh, had these wars that have made people aware that we better wake up uh, or we're going to destroy ourselves. So uh, the violence has itself been a powerful learning experience. But then we've had in the last couple of centuries some people who know there's another way and have gotten very skilled at organizing people to see a different way. Uh, people like Dr. King in the United States and Gandhi in India and others like that are coming along with a, another way. They're both related. Uh, in our work, we see parents who punish children. And uh, it's the same thinking that leads the parents to punish thinking as that lead world leaders to think we have to punish whole nations of people. So they're both related to a way of thinking that started, as best uh, some people I've read uh, believe, started about 8,000 years ago when um, a, a myth started over the, the planet about how the world began. And in this myth, it was held that a very uh, virtuous male god crushed to smithereens an evil female goddess. And out of this crushing of the evil force with the uh, good force, that energy is what created the planet and the people on it. And this started a rather tragic image then that human beings are basically created out of nasty energy and that therefore we need to have some superior people control us. And uh, some theologians and anthropologists that I've studied uh, seem to think that this uh, is how this all got started, this idea that we're basically uh, made out of evil energy and therefore we need to find those people who are closest to the gods. And uh, these people are our superiors and have a right to control us. Well, this is where we started with the idea of blame and criticism and punishment and reward. Mm -hmm. I work now with cultures that uh, evolved out of a different consciousness than that, that have almost no violence, but they have a radically different way of thinking. They don't have this thinking that some people are superiors, and these superiors have a right to control those beneath them. And uh, so that's where I think it began. They relate to the image that this God is a, uh, evaluates everybody, and uh, from birth to death, and when they are judged as good, they get rewarded and go to a place called heaven, and when they are punished, they go to hell. And so this kind of thinking is pervaded over the centuries, and we then have parents who believe they are superior in this realm of the family, and they pass judgment on the children, good, bad, it determines whether reward or punishment. At the schools, you see the same thing. And in business, you see a person called the manager who has the right to judge and blame and, re and reward. 
And then at the uh, national level, you have the peak. So at all levels, you see we have this superior controlling the inferiors, and uh, the, the language that's necessary for that is a language of using the verb to be, to judge what people are. And within that, those systems, you have a concept of justice called retributive justice. It's based on how the superiors judge the inferiors. And that's why I'm very happy in uh, Brazil to see a movement to a radically different consciousness of ju justice based on restorative justice. I have found that when people can connect with what's alive in each other, you see, that's a whole different world than them judging what is the other person? Are they right or wrong, good or bad? But if you judge what's alive in that person, and each can connect with what's alive in each other, it's been my experience that people then enjoy contributing to one another's well-being. But if instead of teaching them to connect with what's alive, you educate them to think of who is what, who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad, then you're going to have violence in that system. The best way I have found for connecting to what's alive in human beings is to be conscious of what are they feeling and what are they needing. All human beings have the same needs, so that when people connect at that level, they don't see people who are different than they are. They see their oneness. We do need to have each person be the final authority at any given moment about what their needs are. But as I said, we all do have the same needs. So whatever needs the other person has, uh, we all have. The difference comes not at our needs, it's how we have been educated to meet our needs. That's where the problem comes in. And uh, the problem comes in with how we have been trained to think. See, I went to schools for 21 years and no one ever asked me what I was feeling or what I was needing. The schools that I went to perpetuated that there are the superiors, in this case the professors, who know what the right answers are, and if you know what the right answers are as they define them, you get rewarded, and if you don't, you get uh, some bad things happen to you. So it uh, has taken me quite a while to develop a consciousness of life, words that describe what is alive in myself and other people. And in my work around the world, I find that when we can connect p groups that have been at war, when we can connect them with what's alive in each other, when they see each other's needs, uh, it's amazing then how conflicts which seem impossible to resolve almost seem to resolve themselves. It's critical that we develop this, and uh, we've started some attempts with the United Nations, but it's been far from functioning in a way that I think we would like, mainly because some countries have really not been willing to give this centralized organization the power it would need to create a world in which everyone's needs are getting met. We have the resources to get everyone's needs met, it's only our thinking that keeps the violence going and the starvation going. So yes, I'm very glad though to see this growing band of people in every country that I work in. I work in about 50 countries. And I see this wonderful group of people in each country. And yes, now the next step is for them to get together and give the United Nations or another organization that we give the power to this power to help us see, create a world where everyone's needs are getting met. We have the resources. The thousands that are starving every day are not because we don't have the food. It's that uh, we haven't seen how we are one, one energy. We're all created out of the same energy, and we can't really enjoy life until we see that everyone's needs are getting met. A student was traveling with me from country to country. 
his university uh, gave him the uh, right to do his internship traveling with me. And this was at a time when many of the countries we were working in were war-torn countries. And I think in about our seventh country, he saw the people that were inviting me in in every country. And he said from his heart, you are a very rich man. Uh, and what he meant by that, he saw that I see a different world than you see on the news. He saw in each of these countries, these people who knew how to relate compassionately, even with the people who were different than they were. And so uh, I am very confident that this group of people around the world is in the process now of figuring out how we can connect and how we can transform those structures that are contributing to the violence. What we need is a radical change in consciousness so that people see the good life is not people who think they're good killing off the bad people. We need to have a different consciousness based on compassionate giving. People need to be conscious of what we do know at a deep level within us. That as human beings, what we enjoy more than anything else is willingly contributing to each other's well-being. All over the planet, I, in my work, I ask people to think of recently when they have done something that has enriched somebody else's life. And when they think of that, I ask them, how does it feel to be conscious that you have this power to contribute to people's well-being? And people smile, and I can just see they're very touched by the question. And nobody has ever told me that they can think of anything that is more enjoyable for we human beings than contributing to people's well-being. In these war-torn countries, I've worked with both sides in many of them, very giving people, very loving people, always on both sides, even though they're killing each other. But it's the consciousness that is the problem. Now, when we spread this awareness that what we all know at a deep level, that compassionate giving is what we human beings enjoy doing. A second part of that consciousness is our oneness, that we can never get our needs fully met at somebody else's expenses. So we have to be aware that the well-being of everybody in the planet is, is our well-being. In all of the countries where we organize people, I'm talking now about war-torn countries, uh, and I pull together the people that I feel I can relate to the easiest and who understand our training and want it in their country. And when we organize these people in all of the, in the countries that we're working in, and we ask them, uh, now, well, how, what do you think we can do to contribute to peace in this area? Where do we need to start? And it's interesting, almost all of them agree that we got to start with the families and the schools because if we want to have peace, we have to radically educate the next generation in a different way. So we still, in each country, we realize we got to do what we can to help make our training available to the warring parties. And uh, we work with the military and the governments, but we really feel that we got to get to the parents and to the schools. So uh, we have radically different schools going now in many countries, radically different, where uh, the teachers and the students relate in a cooperative way, not in a way where the teacher controls the child. We don't have punishments or rewards in our schools. Uh, we never want children to learn anything unless they see how it's going to enrich their life, and they choose to do it. One of the ways we got started in the schools was the amount of violence that exists in many schools, especially in the United States, where I've done most of my work with schools. So whenever the schools just get petrified by the amount of violence, then they're open to change. So we go in and show them how to create a radically different school structure. This involves teaching the teachers, the students, and the parents Nonviolent communication, a different way of communicating with each other. 
we show ways of getting the students to teach each other. So a student who has just learned something teaches others what that student has learned rather than competing with them and getting a better grade. So we have an interdependence that we build into it. And we're very excited about the research showing that in the schools that we've been creating, a, a, drop in, a radical drop in the violence and an increase in learning. I was in the village of Bet Sahur in Palestine, and at the end of the day, a young man, about 22, said to me, Marshal, I like very much nonviolent communication. I think it's going to be very helpful to us in working for peace here. But don't take this as a criticism, Marshal, but you know, this is nothing new. It's just applied Islam. And he saw me smiling, and he said, why are you smiling? And I said, yesterday I was in Jerusalem and an Orthodox rabbi told me it was applied Judaism. And the man who coordinates our program in Sri Lanka is a Jesuit priest. He tells me it's Christianity. And my, uh, the people I work with in India tell me it's Hinduism. And so who am I to believe? Well, so in each of the religions, there's two different ways in which people understand it. Unfortunately, the minority group is the one that I think contributes to peace on the planet, and the other creates the violence. I'm very optimistic about it because I believe it's a more natural language. Uh, Gandhi warns us to be careful about mixing up what's natural with what is habitual. So uh, the language we've been taught, which I think contributes to the violence, is now habitual. We've been trained in this way for centuries. But the good news is, and what gives me optimism, is that I really believe that nonviolent communication is a more natural language, so that when people get exposed to it, they get hungry for it. It makes life very different to live in a natural way where we connect to life within each other. So uh, we see this in our work, where we get groups together that have been on opposite ends fighting with each other. And um, we ask them, what needs of yours would you want to be sure get better met than is going on now in the midst of all of this violence? And what often happens, usually happens, when we get groups together, they don't know how to answer that question of what needs of yours do you want to meet. But when I did this in uh, uh, Nigeria, as you may have read in one of my books, um, one of the chiefs from the Christian tribe screamed across the table at the chiefs that we had organized from the Muslim side. See, I had asked, what needs of yours do we want to get met? And instead of answering my question of what needs, he screamed at the other side, you people are murderers. And the other side screamed back, you people have been trying to dominate us. We won't tolerate it anymore. See, I asked for needs, and I got back diagnoses. Now, in our training, we tell people that all of these criticisms that lead to the violence, all blame, is a tragic expression of an unmet need a tragic expression of an unmet need. So I helped the, the chief who screamed murderer to identify what need was he trying to express when he said that. And I said, chief, are you saying that your need for safety has not been met and you want to be sure that people are safe now? And he looked at me and said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well, he didn't say his need for safety wasn't met. He screamed, you people are murderers. Then I got the other side to hear his needs. It wasn't easy, because when I said, would somebody on this side of the table please tell me what the chief said his needs are? One of them screamed, and why did you kill my son? Uh, I was told ahead of time there was going to be a little bit of tension in there, because three people in the group knew that somebody who killed one of their family was in the room. Anyway, it took a little bit of tension in time, but I got the one chief to express his need for safety. I got the other side finally to hear it. The other side says its need was for equality that wasn't met. And I got this other side to hear it. Now that took me well over an hour just to get them to express needs 
one need each. But then one of the chiefs said to me, Marshal, if we know how to communicate this way, we don't have to kill each other, you see. So that's where we work, is in translating this consciousness that people have gotten from a language of domination. To, it's a language that developed to have kings controlling people. We teach people to translate that to a language of life with the belief that when we can see each other's needs, we see our oneness. We then can realize that we get more joy contributing to one another's well-being than trying to dominate or compete. I'm almost afraid to mention a dream because every time I have a dream, uh, it seems to come true before I can believe it. Uh, so uh, about, oh, now about 30 years ago, I was driving around the United States. I had no money. And I just wanted to get this training, which I felt was valuable, out to people. And I had a dream that if I keep doing this, maybe 20 years after I'm dead, I, there would still be people that found it valuable who were passing it on to others in maybe one person in each part of the world. Right? And that, that image just kept me going under hard times. Just this, well, 10 years later, I was on a plane coming back from India. This, this was the final part of the world where we hadn't teams set up to put. And now here I saw there are teams all over the world passing on this training, which I felt so valuable. And I wasn't even dead one year yet. So just about every time I have a dream that seems impossible, it, uh, it comes true. But what is my dream now? Uh, it's written, it, it's our network's mission. That we really dream of a critical mass of people uh, that would be re-educated and when we could educate a critical mass of people so that everyone's needs were being fulfilled compassionately on the planet. All of the needs for food, all of the needs for safety. I believe this is reachable, that we can create a planet where everyone's needs are being met compassionately.